guest is Dr. Jeffrey Seifert, uh, who of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles uh, out in California. I think, let me go to the slides and we'll share a few of those and I'll introduce Jeff more formally in just a minute. So this is Jeff. Jeff was Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Miami, Florida, and then Associate Director of, of Jerry Zampolsky Center for Attitudinal Healing. In 1992, he joined the staff of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles which was started in 1983 uh, by Ken and Gloria Wapnick. Uh, he currently offers weekly classes on Ken's journey through the text of A Course in Miracles and by monthly seminars on various course themes. I'll we'll bring Jeff on in a minute and do a little bit more uh, chatting with him before we get started. Just a few announcements about things that are coming up. The music you were hearing to start with is from Jeff Olmsted. A Course in Miracles will be sharing that also and an intermission uh, during the, there'll be a time halfway through where you can either uh, step away for the bathroom or just sit and uh, channel along with Jeff, another a different one. This is also brought to you by Miracles Magazine. Uh, we've been in production, believe it or not, for 35 years and uh, very nicely we're uh, growing. If you're new for the first time, this is the first time you've registered with us, you're entitled to a free year subscription to Miracles Magazine and uh, let us know if you'd like to receive it. We would need your uh, street address to do that. Although we also have a digital version, if you'd like to have the digital version, that can be done as well. I want you to know that 20% of whatever payment for today goes to Feed America. Uh, we've been doing this since last year and we'll keep doing it. And Jeff, all right, so this is uh, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, John. Jeff has been working with the foundation since uh, 1992, and what we're going to do it from now until about one o'clock. Is Jeff and I are just going to talk, and then after that, you guys will be able to, first of all, type in questions, and we'll try to deal with the type in questions. And maybe toward the end, we'll have some people come on and actually ask questions if they can. Uh, so, Jeff. Hi again. Hey John, Th thank you for inviting me. It's it's good to be with yeah. you. And with everybody. Really glad to have you. Here. Everybody who can make it in. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll have another time, I think. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you came to work with Ken and what that was all like, and uh, why in the world you're still there. And <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, I have to say, I was just thinking, you know, if uh, I was going to say if Ken were here, K Ken is here. You know, <laughs> he's yeah, that's, there you go. that's always the sense. He's he's just that sense that he, he is with us. Uh, and I know that no matter what would be happening, he, he would be at peace and he would be reminding us. I, I think of, he was always telling us the two workbook lessons, the re, only the, the only two workbook lessons we really need to remember are, uh, I am never upset for the reason that I think, and I could see peace instead of this. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just, I, the world was made to do this, you know, it's, it was made not to work Ken off and said. And so the challenge then is, is to realize that uh, there is an ego purpose for it. And no matter what's happening, there's also, there's also a right-minded purpose or the Holy Spirit's purpose for, for it. And it doesn't matter, you know, we, we get caught in the ego. Ken says it's always a process of going back and forth between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, and so it's just, it doesn't matter when we remember that we have that choice. Uh, but we, then that that shift to the peace uh, right. is always there. So so anyway, that's uh, yes, I am still still here with the foundation after all these years, and uh, it actually began. Uh, I I really became aware of Ken. I was I felt very fortunate uh, very shortly after I saw the course for the first time. Uh, it was in December of, of uh, 1986. I. Uh, following month, I got my own copy of it, found a group. I, I was living in Miami at the time, and I found a group that uh, was actually 
using Ken really uh, kind of as their guide for how they wanted to approach the teaching and made friends with somebody who was buying Ken's books and tapes. So, I mean, very early on, I had the opportunity to hear what Ken was saying. I, I think it was the special relationship tapes that had just been released and the friend would lend me a, a single cassette at, at a time to play. And I remember my initial reaction was, uh, well, I'm not sure, you know, this, this, I, I was certain this was a book that was supposed to be a relationship between me and its author. And I wasn't sure I wanted a, a third party in there interpreting things for me, but I just, uh, I, I listened to what Ken was saying and I would read more of the course and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> he's very, very helpful. And I, in the group itself then too, the, the, what I w went to weekly, uh, she was on the mailing list for the foundation. This was in 87 and got a newsletter from them that was saying that a foundation was opening in Roscoe, New York. Uh, and I guess it, they were in the process of, of getting things ready. They purchased the property up in the Catskills. Uh, and I remember at the time having the thought that I, I really would like to go there, but I also had the sense that it wasn't time yet. And I did end up, um, circumstances ended up leaving me. Uh, I took a leave of absence from, uh, I was at the University of Miami uh, in the Department of Pediatrics, a psychologist in the, a developmental psychologist in the Department of Pediatrics. And I ended up spending time about four years with uh, Jerry Jampolsky uh, at his Center for Attitudinal Healing. But I always had this feeling, I, I knew that at some point I really wanted to, to go to the foundation and um, be able to to spend time with with Ken and with Gloria. I had my first opportunity. I went to a, a psychotherapy weekend workshop in uh, I guess it was the, the fall of 1990. It was just a weekend workshop, and I was very disappointed because one of the things Ken apparently there was an agreement with everybody who came to it saying, and we won't be talking about the metaphysics. Uh, that was kind <laughs> of an agreement he had with with all of the therapists. They wanted to get into the quote practical stuff. And so uh, I did have a brief opportunity uh, in the breakfast uh, the last morning of the of the weekend. I got come with a list of questions. And uh, Ken just matter of fact, I mean, I would I would raise questions, things that I was wanting to understand about the course. And it just mostly was just give me a yes or no answer uh, to everything I was asking. And then I, I then I also mentioned that it felt like uh, with the people that I was with back in California when I was talking about the course, it felt like they were attacking me. And he just said, well, that's because you want to be attacked. Oh boy. <laughs> and that was all he said. And that pretty much, you know, as I recall, wrapped up our meeting. And it's, it took less than five minutes, you know, maybe two or three minutes was what all it seemed to be. But that was, and yet I certainly didn't feel judged when he said that. I mean, that was what was so remarkable about it. It was like, I certainly didn't know enough of the metaphysics to, uh, to really appreciate what it was that he was saying about uh, that I wanted to be attacked, but I knew somehow, I, I knew somehow that that was true. And I knew that part of my process really was going to be coming to understand more of, of why that would, was true. Could you say something right there, uh, going right to the teaching of A Course in Miracles? We'll come back to what you're saying, but how would we undo the feeling of wanting to be attacked? By recognizing the purpose that it's serving. It's, the desire to be attacked is, for most of us, it's unconscious. Sometimes it might become conscious. We, you know, we're invested when we're identified with the ego in seeing ourselves as victims. So we have to believe that uh, somebody else is the cause of our upset or something else. You know, I'm never upset for the reason that I think. Uh, it seems like it's what's happening in the world. It seems like it's what's right. happening in my relationships. But what I, a big part of the course process, Ken says, is really being able to recognize that we made, we literally made the world and all of our relationships to serve the purpose of concealing the guilt that we really have within our minds, that we all share the guilt over believing that we're separate, the, of the belief that we have attacked our source, we've attacked love, we've destroyed it. I mean, that, <laughs> that's, the, that's what the wrong mind is all about. It's that. It takes, uh, seems like it takes us to chapter 21, section two, I'm responsible for what I see, period. Yes. Yeah. 
And, yeah, right. <laughs> and it's, but as Ken often emphasized, you know, it's not, it's not the self in the world who, that we're identified with. It's, it's that mind, it, uh, when we get to the chart, the decision-making mind uh, that really is, it's the dreamer of the dream. It's, it's, our, it's our self in a split mind. And we're, you know, we all, we're, most of us are not really in touch with, well, none of us are really in touch with all of the powers of, of the mind. But we do, one power, the Course tells us that we do have always is to choose how we're going to look at whatever it is that we are experiencing in the world. Right. And we begin to recognize that my reaction to what's out there is a mirror to the decision I've made in my mind. And so if I'm peaceful, you don't even have a second thought about it. You are just at peace. And that means that I'm, I'm identified you know, with my right mind and you don't even think about it. But if I'm not at peace, that's, that's what I need to be able to recognize. It seems like it's this external situation, but it isn't really. Right, it's, never. <laughs> it's, it's this choice that I've made. So now I'm getting an opportunity to, to see my guilt. And I can also emphasize that the problem isn't the guilt. The problem is that I believe the guilt is real. And that's what I need help from, from my right mind, from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus, because they know it isn't. Uh, so that's, that's been what opens the door to healing, is when I recognize that it's my own choice for the ego, but there is an alternative available. That's, the, that's why the decision maker, as Ken named, that part of the mind is so central to the teaching and certainly the, uh, is very central to the way Ken was always trying to communicate its message to us. Right. You wanna, you wanna uh, show the chart and get into the metaphysics a little bit? Uh, is sure. that very exciting? Um, can we do that? Sure, yeah. Cause I, I think thinking about things that are uh, really very important contributions that Ken has made to our understanding and study of the course. I, I see the chart really as way up there in terms of just being uh, such a powerful, clear snapshot of the whole uh, metaphysics of the course. And uh, it, when I was sending this off to Bud yesterday, uh, and he opened it up to make sure he was seeing it okay, and he, he gravitated immediately to that circle right in the, in the center there, which is the decision maker, and, and commented on, you know, this is something that he just felt so very, very helpful about, about the chart. And I, I think that's, you know, it, to, to have that re realization is, is central. I mean, there's a lot going on in the chart. There's a lot that the ego has put in, in place to distract us. But that's really where we want to bring our focus back to that, that decision maker. It's, it's interesting that that's a, the word decision maker does occur once in the course, but it talks about uh, re really a sense that the world is, is wanting I mean, I'm sorry that the ego is wanting us to see the body as the decision maker. So that's the only place where it's used, but sort of implicit in that is that there is another decision maker. And that's, so Ken has taken, taken that term and used it to describe um, that, that point that is really the self or the, the son of God is asleep in the dream. Uh, and you can see on the chart that it's labeled the decision maker that again, that circle that's right up there, right? right between the ego wrong mind and the Holy Spirit right mind. And, and that's, that's also can all, always emphasized. This is what makes the course so simple. Uh, the world's complicated. Right. But when you get back to that point, and that's, you see the miracle that comes from the world that's over on the right hand side, that arrow that goes all the way back up to the, uh, to the circle of the decision maker, that that's what the miracle is all about, shifting our attention away from, you know, we, we're, we get caught initially in what's going on in the world, whatever the problem may be. Uh, and the practice is always one of shifting our attention away from what seems to be happening to us as a body in the world and shifting back to that point where we really have a choice about which teacher we're going to listen to. And again, that, that's the simplicity of the teaching Ken is trying to help us recognize is that it's, it just always comes down to who am I going to listen to, which teacher? But it takes a long, it takes a long time really to, to be willing really to recognize that all of my upset is coming from 
just this choice. There may be some, some situations where we're willing to, to ask for help to recognize it, but then there are others where we just miss it completely and we really think it's the situation. And it never, ever is. It never right. is. I remember once Ken saying that the power of decision is the central teaching. This is the central teaching of the Course in Miracles. You have a choice. <laughs> that all comes down to that. Yeah. And uh, it, by the time I actually, I, I went and did a retreat uh, the following year after I went to that psychotherapy workshop. And he had, a, he had the chart at that point, and I don't know, I can't remember quite how far back it was that he had already developed that. Uh, there were some things, there was, I know there was a, a workshop uh, in 1989 uh, that he did on, it was actually, it was called The Message Jesus and the Message of Easter, which is kind of appropriate for right now. The title's been changed uh, to now, it's, it's Jesus, uh, Teacher of Forgiveness, Model of Resurrection. But I, I noticed I was look I was looking at that one because uh, he really focuses on the whole e Easter theme and uh, crucifixion and resurrection. Like two thirds of, of the set is really uh, focusing on on those two themes, and you could see already emerging there. He had a chart in there that was very similar to this, but it did it wasn't quite in this in this framework. Uh, but that by the time I went there in in uh, ninety one. It was when I finally did get to hear some metaphysics. Every every program he did, he was using the chart. He was very he had variations on it. I mean, that's the beauty of the chart that you can fit all the different concepts of, of the of the course into the chart uh, to recognize just what it is that really that, that Jesus is talking about. As I say, it's it's just a wonderful snapshot. Uh, but it. I was fortunate, as I say, when I went for that one month retreat a year later, that I really got exposed to it. And it was, I remember initially it was like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I could barely hear what he was saying. Didn't know what he was talking about. By the end of my month there, <laughs> it was like, okay. I actually knew it well enough to at least be able to tell students when I went back to, to California, what I had learned about the chart. But that was an intellectual understanding <laughs> right. at that point. Uh, it was a long, long way to go, uh, you know, to really integrate it into my uh, in experience and to really be able to use it all the time uh, in approaching the material in the, in the course. And, and then there was a year later in 92 uh, before I then fi finally joined, joined the staff. Uh, but w one of the things I think, too, is, is especially helpful uh, with, with this chart that that Ken has developed is you can really see that there are like there are th essentially three layers here, and we we talk so much about body, mind, and spirit, and they really are all represented on here. And of course, what we're we're most familiar with, what we experience all the time, is down there at the bottom of the chart. Uh, it's below what Ken Ken has called the veil of, of forgetfulness or, or denial, because uh, that's the problem. Everything that's above that, above that veil of forget that veil of forgetfulness uh, we've just denied to our awareness to our consciousness and so we're just uh, believe and identify ourselves as, as a body down here in the world of separation so that's the body and that that of course we know the course is telling us is really an illusion because it's the world is a dream but for those of us while we're dreaming and think that we're here in the world the experience is, is very real just like when we're sleeping at night, uh, Jesus even reminds us of that. Okay, so that's the body level. Then you go above the veil of forgetfulness, and what you have is you see over on the left under under cause it says split mind. And so my, this is the the mind level in the course uh, with a lowercase m. Uh, and this is really important. This is what's so un, uh, is is kept unconscious. This is where we have the, the decision making power to choose between those two teachers, but it's also all out of our awareness. And this is what the course is trying to help us begin to recognize that, that we're not a body, we're a mind. Uh, now, ultimately, you go to the top of the chart, heaven, uh, where you've got capital M mind, that's spirit. So, and spirit is actually our only reality. And so, so Ken has it laid out so beautifully here. As I say, it's, it's just a snapshot of the whole thing. And you've got it in in, in layers. Uh, I mean, there's it's just packed with so much 
so much helpful information uh, to really to be able to kind of visualize as you're reading the course what it is that uh, that Jesus is trying to tell us. But spirit, spirit, we're not at all in touch with. Mind, we can, you know, we we just have a, a glimmer of of what the mind is really capable of in terms of dreaming a world and making all of this real. But the, the good news, as Ken emphasizes over and over again, is what we can get in touch with. And the only thing we need to get in touch with is this power to choose between those two teachers. And the world then becomes the way in which we are able to recognize which teacher we've chosen. And you don't really have to analyze anything. You just have to check it and say, how do I feel? Am I at peace or I'm in, am I in conflict? Is there tension here? And it's, it's as simple as that. Simple as that. Right. Can I talk a little bit about the, um, more about the metaphysics of uh, why this is not a real world or why this is a, a, well, it's obviously a dream, but it sure doesn't seem like a dream. No, no. And, and that Ken says that's, that's another one of the really unique contributions of the course. He's, he makes very clear uh, that there really is a purpose. Uh, it's not just something that happened. And it certainly is not something that has just happened to us. <laughs> that's what that's all part of what Ken says is, is really an, an ego strategy. It's a very deliberate strategy uh, because quite simply, when we if we were only identified with mind and weren't identified with the body, the choice that we have would become really obvious. And the consequences of choosing the ego uh, would be apparent that it's something that really involves pain because it involves separation from love. Yeah. And, and so uh, as Ken has told the story, it's, it's not laid out specifically in the course in any one place, but it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's, it's Ken's just his, his wonderful grasp of the material that he was able to, to pull from all of these things that come in all you know various uh, parts of the course and to recognize that implicit under beneath everything that Jesus was saying is this strategy of the ego. And so Ken has made it explicit. And the strategy, he's talked about it in uh, oftentimes in, in many, varies it in, in different ways, but essentially it boils down to that the, the ego is fearful, fearful that of the power of our mind to have chosen it, meaning that it could also choose something else, which is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the memory Ken has, has described it as the memory that we've brought into our dream, into our sleeping mind that remembers our reality as spirit, remembers the oneness. All right. And so, go ahead. Well, it's, it's in me, it, there's a passage I was trying to look for yesterday. I thought it said someplace where it said that the ego suspects that there's something else. Did you know that? Uh, I couldn't find it yesterday when I was looking for it, but I thought yeah, I, 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 I think I know what you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, but it, but uh, I mean, it kind of said it doesn't, the only thing that it really has any true awareness of, it doesn't know, it doesn't know spirit. It doesn't really know Holy Spirit or what Holy Spirit is, but what it does know is that it, its existence depends on the minds having chosen it. Right. That's, There's also that's the sense the, of us being doomed. But it, of its of its, being, of its being doomed. I mean that uh, ultimately, yeah, that it's it's transitory. <laughs> it's, right. It wants to be eternal, but it isn't. I mean that's and I we, and it was kind of kind of said, and Jesus even says he talks about uh, the course talks about it as if the ego were a separate thing, but it really is. It is just a part of of our mind that we are identifying with because because there is this part of our mind that likes the idea of being separate. We think there's something. Right special something yes. something positive we think that comes with being on our own being being as Ken, Ken often says an individual and but there's also loneliness I think that, well that's uh, yeah those, that's the downside the ego it's as Ken has laid it out and as, as he tells the ego myth of the ego strategy it's like it it says this is wonderful there's triumph there's victory there's uh having something for yourself <laughs> And then, and then 
come after we think that we're already there, then we begin to start to see the downside of it. But it also needs it needs a further defense, and that's what Ken is saying. Saying if if you you really begin to see how this whole issue of choice uh, is so important, because he says the ego doesn't want us to remember that we have a choice. Right. Because that's what threatens it. That's what it's fearful about, that we make it, that it will make a different choice. And so Ken has said the strategy then is uh, essentially to make us mindless, to make us forget completely the power of the mind and to forget that we really are a mind that has a choice. And so, so that's the whole story then that, oh, yes, you are separate, but this really was an attack. This, this was destructive. It's real. It's serious. You know, and all the time the Holy Spirit is over, over there saying, no, you know, this is silly. You couldn't do this. You can't, you can't affect oneness. You can only think that you can. And the ego is saying, oh, yes, we did. Something serious has happened. And so that's, that's the birth of sin. Right. So, that's, so that's the strategy then is to, to make this idea of separation really serious. And so you're sinful. And with the sin, of course, comes guilt. Right. The guilt is overwhelming. Uh, and then in, in all of the contradictions that are just inherent in the ego thought system, uh, as Ken says, it's like God is back on the scene somehow. <laughs> and he's not at all happy. <laughs> And so he's out to seek revenge and he wants to destroy us. He wants to take back what we've taken from him. And so that's fear. So that's, 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 the, ego's story. that's the ego story then yeah. uh, to lead us then to want to get out of the mind. And that's then where the dream of the world comes from because uh, we, we shatter, we fragment, we just separate over and over again into billions and billions of fragments, seemingly separate bits of mind, project out into a, a world of form, we think, uh, individual bodies, and now it's the dream of the world. But, but we wanted so much to get away from the wrath of God, and that's so fearful, we then have denied all of that. So that's that veil of forgetfulness on the chart. So that's why, as you were asking, why, you know, how comes we don't Remember this. Why is it that it seems like we're really here? And that's that's part of the ego strategy. You'll see on the chart itself. Maybe, maybe you can go ahead and put that up again, bud. But that that's the ego's purposes, again, to, to make us mindless. We project out into the world. Right. And uh, this is all we're aware of. This, you, you see down in the uh, on the left hand side below effect, it can has mindlessness that the word mindless appears a number of times in the course. The word mindlessness itself doesn't, but that's really what Ken, Ken is trying to help us see is really the characteristic of our, our thinking here in the world. We just have no memory at all of the power of the mind to have dreamt this whole thing. You know, it's Jesus helps us see that we do get in touch with that power. Uh, when we're dreaming at night and then wake up and see what what our mind can make up but we still think it's we still think it's his body that's dreaming we don't really recognize you know that's going on in the brain so that's just all part of part of the ego's strategy to keep us unaware of where the power really rests in the mind and so that's the whole purpose of projection then is to get us out of the mind and to believe that the mind is a dangerous place well it's not truly dangerous to us <laughs> it's dangerous to the ego and that's that's what uh but when we're identified with the ego then then we think that it's dangerous to us and the amazing thing is that there is no ego uh, so we're <laughs> right <laughs> right you know, we're, we're playing around with a fantasy here yeah and that's keep what keeps us in the dreamland or the dream world and that's the uh the little red arrow that's coming off the circle that's the decision maker that's that's a really critical part of this whole uh chart that ken has laid out for us here because just as you were saying john it's like the ego doesn't even exist the guilt is not real you know and and see that that's our problem when we try to deal with anything here in the world even though we may know the metaphysics in our experience there still is guilt and we're trying to do something to get rid of it and we try to the ego's plan for atonement, which involves, you know, some kind of suffering and sacrifice. And 
but what Ken has said and what that little red arrow represents is it's our belief. That little red arrow is we choose to believe in this thought system. That's the only problem. Guilt is not the problem. The ego is not the problem. They have no power unless that little red arrow, you know, we, you know, we've chosen that little red arrow, chosen to believe in it and given, given the wrong mind power. And then what, once we've done that, then that whole strategy goes into play and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're in a world victimized by all of these terrible forces outside of us that we have no control over. Right. And the whole point is we have ultimate control. And we, and we do. Yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, yeah. other, other paths might try to teach us how we can change the dream, but that's Ken, Ken has tried to emphasize that's not at all the purpose of the course. The purpose of the course, really, if, if it's our path, it's to help us awaken from it. Right. And, and so that's Ken emphasized over and over and over again over the years that we don't want to bring Jesus or the Holy Spirit into the world, but that's, you know, that's still what we want to do. I mean, that's the defense works really well. We still, most of the time, believe we're here, believe that this is what's real. And the other seems like a fantasy to say the mind is, is, is the reality. And certainly the spirit is beyond anything we can comprehend. And of course, spirit can't be comprehended because to comprehend or grasp something means that there's you and there's something else. And that's, that's, the, that's the whole thing that nothing above, there are no symbols. We have words up there, but there are no symbols. There's no concepts. There's no images in heaven. So, so as soon as you're talking about perception, you're down in the little M mind. Uh, that's where consciousness is experienced. Uh, the course uses the term a little differently from, from other paths. Uh, consciousness is what emerged with the split. And uh, you might say, I mean, that's if there's one thing that we're kind of in touch with while we're still identified as bodies in the world is, you know, we're aware of that we can be conscious of things. And that's not in the body. It's not in the brain. That's that's like our little glimpse of, of what the mind is, because uh, and Jesus says that's what can be trained. He talks about that in the clarification of terms. The consciousness can be trained, but uh, we spirit is so far beyond anything that we can can understand. It's only something that can be experienced. Uh, the problem once we once we fell asleep, essentially what we did we we now had images and we now had concepts, and there became this possibility of a of a self and another uh, duality, as Ken talks about it, uh, and that's. That's the problem then is that we think that, that there's some kind of a split. That's what the separation is saying. There's a split between me and something else. God initially, but then we make up a world where everything seems to be split off from the body that I think that, that I am. So, so the problem really is, it's not, all, it's, it's not the body, it's not the world. It's not even as we were saying, the ego or the sin, guilt, and fear. It's the way we're interpreting all of it. And, and that's really then what it boils down to. There are two, two alternative interpretations, Ken would say, of, of this tiny mat idea. There are two teachers we can turn to. Uh, the ego is, is going to want to interpret it always as serious. So that's why you know, Ken, Ken could stay peaceful no matter what was happening <laughs> because he knew there was nothing serious. But the only reason we think anything is serious here is because we still believe the guilt is real in our mind. And that's the filter that we're looking at things through. So, you know, but we shouldn't be surprised at that either. You know, no. it's, uh, uh, and, and certainly no one can always say, you don't want to feel guilty about the fact that you feel guilty. <laughs> uh, you want to just be able to recognize you're still listening to the wrong teacher. Right. And, and that's, that's, that's the way out of it. Uh, it's well, guilt, it's choosing guilt, believing in the guilt that makes things seem serious. Can we, let's talk about another illusion there for a, a second, sure. which is uh, time. So, in time, um, do you think that there's an evolution 
in consciousness of us to move more this way? I mean, I, I see a lot, for example, with the death of the church, which is a phenomenon that's, that's uh, growing rapidly at the moment. Uh, my sense is that people are looking for something more, something deeper, and, and the Course is that kind of thing, which is deeper, which is more, which can begin to get us out of some of that heavy-duty, dogmatic philosophy that the Church has carried around for so long, which has not been helpful. Okay. So the question is, is there an evolution? Are, 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 are we growing as a a species, so to speak. <laughs> or, as a con- or as a consciousness, as you were saying. I know what Ken would, what Ken would say is uh, it can appear that way with, within the dream, within our experience of linear time. Uh, and so it seems like there is, uh, although, although certainly Ken and Gloria have said that if you scratch below the surface, in terms of what's going on in the world. It's like the guilt and the hatefulness is there just as much as it ever has been. It doesn't mean that some fragments of mind are, you know, not moving towards awakening, but he would, they would also say that that's always been true always. So it's part, it's part of the ego illusion to, to make us believe that there is sign of some kind of a progression because ultimately time isn't linear. So it's like, we just keep pulling, keep pulling, images, if you will, out of, out of the unconscious and projecting them that, that have this meaning that then would suggest that there is a linear progression or an evolution. Uh, and, you know, and, and if it's helpful, that's okay. But ultimately, Ken would say that's, that can't really be what's, what's happening. Uh, it's, it can't be linear. I mean, it, we have to model it in terms of linear terms, even in terms of thinking about our own individual minds and just talk some talks about clarification in terms of our consciousness being trained. And that, of course, has to be happening across lifetimes. Uh, and ultimately, it is just one consciousness that believes that it's multiple consciousnesses that's being trained. But that's all really happening in the mind. No, nothing is happening in the world. Would, would, re- would the concept of reincarnation also imply, however, evolution in that sense that we, we, we we get better as we go through these trials and tribulations of, of choosing different lives. Um, again, uh, it, it can be, you know, it can be helpful because even Jesus even talks about on the manual, uh, you know, that speaking about reincarnation, uh, ultimately it can't really be so, but it still can be helpful. Uh, so we use whatever's helpful while we still believe that we're here and while we still believe that we're in linear time. We have to, we have to work with it. So yeah, so the, the whole idea of reincarnation can be helpful in terms of realizing this is not the only life. Uh, I think it's a, it's a helpful way of realizing, well, if, if this is the body that, that I am this time, but I've had other lives and obviously I'm not my body. Uh, and that can help me get in touch with the fact that, well, then what am I? So I must be, I must be mind. I must be con- consciousness. Uh, Ken didn't use the word consciousness so much. I mean, he did speak about no. it. Um, um, but, but he, he did emphasize, that he, he, used, he preferred to use the, the word mind or decision maker. Um, but it's, but, but all, all concepts can be helpful. They're, they end up being neutral. The ego makes them to keep us rooted here in the dream and, and rooted in, in this reality. Uh, but that's the, the beauty of the course. It takes all of our symbols. This is what Ken sa- says over and over again. The Holy Spirit re- reinterprets everything. He takes them. And he gives them a different meaning and a different purpose. So, uh, so if we find it helpful, uh, the, the trap can be that uh, some people want to believe that things are getting better here because they want here to be better <laughs> rather than waking up. <laughs> and, you know, it, nobody's pushing us to wake up, certainly. Uh, but, but there's something that um, the, the course let's talk about the attraction of God, yes, yes, the attraction of God, which I always say, sort of says the like the attraction of guilt and the attraction of God. These like yes, these and it's more powerful. It's much more powerful. Yes, and, and, and there's some reason why we're here today talking about this. Yes, as though there is a way to for to freedom. Yes, to actually get out of here once and for all. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think, you know, Ken wouldn't have spent so much time teaching and writing books and all if, 
he didn't believe that somehow doing these things would be helpful. Uh, right. And that's, uh, but, but his emphasis always was, you know, it, 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 we're free to use any of these teachings, whatever we want them for, but ultimately he was wanting us to recognize that this is really a, a path to awakening uh, and not to a better, better dream. And that really, that was behind just all of all of his teachings. That's why he emphasized so much that we really need to look at the ego because we wouldn't we wouldn't believe that we're bodies if we didn't believe in sin and guilt and attack and destruction. That's that's why we experience ourselves as bodies. That's why we ex experience a world. Most people don't want to look at that. Uh, no. Even students of, of Ken's don't want to look at that. It's no. uh, it's not easy. For one thing, it makes you think, uh, well, then then there's this big thing called death. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the yeah. death of the body looks like on the ego's level. It, that's the end. Yeah. You know, if, if you can't see beyond it. Yeah. And that's, you know, Ken on over and over again in his uh, on death and dying uh, program that he, he did back in, I think it was, I think it was in 2011. Uh, a week long on that and he just said what happens when you die nothing <laughs> that clearly has to mean that i'm identified with the mind and not with the body uh and that but that again was what he was trying to help us recognize and and so it is possible if, as by identification shifts and that was something can you know over and over again emphasize we we have to read the course as a mind and not as a body or it won't make any sense and if we the more we can open up to that possibility that we are mind that's essentially observing everything that's going on rather than really really getting caught in participating in it then that ident identification will increase and the fear then that's associated with being identified as a body uh, will subside we won't need the defense that the body is because the, again the body is only there to, def to defend it and protect the guilt that's in the mind and so if we can identify with the decision maker, uh, we can look at the ego rather than think that we are the ego. And that's why the ego doesn't want us to do that. That's why that part of us that wants to continue to be separate still wants to buy into the drama here, get, ca get caught in whatever it is, you know, what's going on with the pandemic, what's been going on uh, politically in, th in this country. Uh, it it's, <laughs> there's just all kinds of opportunities to take things seriously and, and to project our guilt outside of ourselves. So a, a good part of what I hear, is, hear you saying is that we can have peace of mind right here, I mean, right now. Right can, now, that's right. right now. I can just be yeah. okay about my technical difficulties with the computer. <laughs> that's right, that's right, yes. And, uh, uh, you know, it's at some level, you know, at some level there was, it, whatever we're experiencing, it's something that each one of us has agreed at some level to, to experience. Otherwise, we would be a victim of it. So, you know, it's, uh, it, that that's, includes, I'm sorry, that includes collectively. That includes collectively, we've collectively, collectively, that's right. That's right. Yeah, to do this. I mean, I mean, there's that interesting line in the course, you know, where it says those who are meet will meet, you know, and so it's like you, you wonder sometimes how you get into certain meetings. And, and sometimes it seems like a blissful, wonderful thing. And the next time you wonder, how did I get this person in my life? <laughs> I asked for this? <laughs> the screaming child, why, you know, like, but you know that's, there's, a, there's the wrong-minded reason that we asked for it, but there's always the right-minded too. And that, that again, you know, it's, it's, there's, always, there's always both choices there. And as long as we stay with, with the ego, then we only see ourselves as victims. But there's always, no matter how horrendous it is, there's always that opportunity to recognize that it's still really only, a, I'm not at peace because, because of the interpretation I'm making of it and who I'm listening to. And so it's, you know, wow, if we go through something that's really difficult and recognize that we can be at peace so let's, middle, let's or even afterwards, that's powerful. That's so much healing. Yeah. Let, let's talk about something about that we're looking at right now, which is uh, next weekend is uh, Easter. And yeah. next Friday is Good Friday. And so uh, Jesus on the cross uh, yeah. can be at peace. Yes. In that situation. Yes. Like, yeah. in, like he talks about in the message of the crucifixion in chapter right. six. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's that was one of the things early on. I remember when Ken was talking about uh, as I was listening to those in, the, in that first year or so, where he was talking about Jesus. Uh, crucifixion and he said as far as Jesus was concerned he could take a walk in the park or be crucified it wouldn't have made any difference right. uh, because he well you know ultimately it was, it's because there was no guilt in his mind and therefore he was not identified with with the body he knew other people would identify with the figure in the dream uh, because because they needed to but he didn't and so that's that's our way that's our way out but it comes through undoing the guilt uh, and the body then becomes, this is how it changes the whole purpose of the body, then instead of being something uh, through which I'm victimized, it now becomes the way in which I get to recognize the, the choice that I've been making in my mind for which, which teacher I'm wanting to listen to. Right. And again, that it's, it's not easy because there's a strong defense against doing that, but it is, thank God, it's simple. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate simplic simplicity of the teaching. It seems complicated because Jesus is trying to help us understand what we've made, which is the ego. <laughs> and that is complicated. That's that's its purpose to really be uh, something that will just trap us in its its weave of complexity, web web of complexity. Right. Well, thanks. Yes. So um, but at this point, folks, we are going to have a, a 10 minute intermission. You can take a break or whatever, and we're going to listen to uh, uh, Jeff Olmsted uh, chanting, uh, I am not a body. I am not a body. I am not a body. I am free. I am free. For I am still. I am still. As God created me. As God created me. I am not a body. For the for the balance of our, our time uh, first of all we're going to start off with questions and let's looking at questions that were in the chat let's start with some of those questions first and uh, Jeff or myself or whoever uh, will respond a couple of questions here so one of them that is kind of interesting is uh you guys were speaking earlier i just want to kind of revisit this just briefly about the holy spirit can you explain what the holy spirit's role is and just talk a little bit more about that okay sure uh ken is ken has made clear that the holy spirit is is really not a person the Holy Spirit is a symbol in our mind, uh, and we certainly can experience him as a presence, uh, but he's he's a symbol of the truth about ourselves. He's, he's a symbol of love. Uh, he's, not, he's not involved in the world at all. 
uh, it, can it has emphasized, and you know we may try to to involve him. But the the point is, he's he's just simply a, a presence that reminds us of the truth of who we are, reminds us of the love that is still ours, but that we just keep denying to ourselves. And so, he, and and he's always. I, I think one of the things that's very helpful with with the chart to see is that it, it's showing how he's just always there, present. It's there. It's we turn away from him. We ignore or deny his presence, but it's there. And, it's, and in a sense, we can't ever really uh, escape from it, even when we try to deny it. There's th the reason that we are so unhappy in our lives when we are unhappy is because there's a part of us that knows that we deserve so much more. And so we could never be satisfied with anything here. Uh, so the Holy Spirit really represents that, that, that memory. Uh, and... And when we join with that part of our mind, what it does then is just simply shines away what's in the wrong mind, because that's the part of our mind that knows that the ego isn't real. So what's really shifted is that little red arrow that was going to the to the ego. It's like we in that, that moment, then we're choosing to believe in the correction that the Holy Spirit represents. And so you might say it becomes a green arrow then to keep it color code correctly. It shifts over to the right mind. And now we, we're trusting what is coming from the right mind, which it's, it's a correction. It doesn't change anything, literally. It just undoes that belief that we have in the ego. So, yeah, so there, there's our red arrow. So you might think of it swinging over then to the and, and turning green on the on the right minded side when we when we shift to the Holy Spirit as our teacher. So so again, it's OK, you know, Jesus is even more specific in our experience. I mean, he's, he's a part of, describes himself as part of the, uh, the sonship, whereas the Holy Spirit is really more like uh, just simply this, this presence, this memory of, of who we are. And, uh, and Jesus represents a part of the sonship that remembered that. And essentially, because we are all part of that one sonship, he has remembered for all of us. He's the part of our mind that, that has made that identification. Excellent. Thank you. So here's an, here's another question. You know, we're talking about this existence here and the course talks a lot about the happy dream. And there's a comment in the course that says, fear not, you'll be hurled into reality. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the hurling into reality and the happy dream, please? Well, that, that's the ego's fear. <laughs> yes. That's what we're afraid of. Uh, you know, and that's how the ego keeps its hold on us, if you will, because because we, you know, Ken has emphasized over and over again, we move along on this path just as quickly or as slowly as we want to. And if we think that we're not, not moving as quickly as, as we think we want to, it's because there's still some unconscious fear there that we're just not in touch with. And that's really what you want to be able to get to get in touch with. And then what about the happy dream? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the happy dream. Uh, Ken, again, Ken has emphasized uh, it is not about our dream in the world becoming happier. It's the happy dream is the same as dr dreams of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So it means that I am recognizing whenever I'm caught in my own judgments and I'm willing to let them go. When I do, peace, peace that is there, and. I'm happy, regardless of what is happening in my dream, regardless of of what's working or isn't working in my dream. And so that that's that's where we're heading towards. And the, the ultimate happy dream, maybe with capital H, is is the real world when we've really made the choice for the atonement uh, once and for all, and we're not going to vacillate. That arrow is not going to swing back and forth anymore. It's just going to stay. Uh, as, as Jesus represents for us, uh, the par a part of the mind that has identified uh, completely with the with the right mind. But along the way, the, the lowercase happy dream is when we realize more and more of the time that we have a choice in terms of how we're going to experience our lives, and it doesn't depend on anything external changing. I mean that that's powerful. Uh, I know a lot of people would would complain. Oh, Ken, you know this isn't practical. What you're saying isn't practical. I want to know what to do. <laughs> and Ken would say, you know, th this course is not about behavior. You need to go somewhere else if that's really what you're wanting guidance about. 
Uh, this course is only about changing your mind. And what could be more practical than to know that I could be at peace? Doesn't that regardless of what's happening? But once I change my mind, that probably changes my behavior. It, it certainly can, yes, yeah. yes, and it could end up changing others' behavior too. But you know, but that doesn't become your focus. That's the that's the way the ego will also try to get us sucked back into the world. Oh, hey, this works! I get what I want. <laughs> uh, you know, and so, so you just have to notice it's it's not wrong to have that reaction. It's kind of natural while we're still identified with the ego, but you just begin to recognize. Oh, I've I've gotten caught again. And you just realize that if I stay with that, the situation can change again, and then I'll be unhappy again because I'm looking for my happiness outside of me. You're right, too. When I, when I have the choice between, if I want to ask for help, um, I, I tend to go to Jesus rather than the Holy Spirit uh, just because I have an image of, yes. Yes. of Jesus. And we all have this image. Uh, and so it's just like a little more personal somehow. Another. Yeah, that for me yeah. personally, too. I That's... Uh, he's, he presents himself as, as an elder brother. Uh, yeah. we, we have this sense that he experienced life as a body somehow, whatever, you know, however that might have been. Uh, so yes, so it, as a, he, he's a brother, he's a part of the sonship. He's less abstract. That, by the way, is one of the ways that I always viewed Ken as an elder brother. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was a, a, about six months older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously a lot smarter. <laughs> So it was, he, probably, he just had less guilt than we did. <laughs> we do. Uh, he was, he was, well, Helen in the beginning was the go-to person, but went after she got sick, but yeah, yeah. Ken took over in that department. I would go to him instead. He was always very kind and gentle and, and, but also sometimes Perfect. a little strict, a little strong. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But not, but never not loving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was, there was no judgment there. That's that's why that's we right. experienced it as as loving because there was no no judgment in the sense of condemnation. Maybe some discernment in terms of this maybe not the wisest choice to be making right now, but but not not judgment in the sense of criticism or condemnation. Uh, so right. you're making a mistake. Do you still want to keep doing this? That you know that very gentle, very kind. Right. You know, that a great segue into the next question, which was, what was it like for you, Jeff, to work with Ken? And do you feel like he was in the happy dream, in the real world? Where do you feel like he was in context of, of the Course's teachings? Uh, it, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience to, to, you know, to be able to work in a setting where it, it was interesting after a while, I didn't see him that often after a while, he would come by my office at the beginning of the day when he came over to, to what we call the West Wing of the building, the West Wing and, and greet everybody. Then he'd be back on the other side uh, in his office and with the staff on that side. Uh, and then maybe at the end of the day, he, he would come around again before he was leaving. Uh, but there was just a sense of, of his presence, uh, which I must say that uh, at some level, I began to recognize that it didn't have anything to do with his physical presence. Uh, and I think that's maybe made it, made it easier in, in some respects uh, once he was no longer physically present. Uh, I certainly used to experiencing him simply by listening to him on, on audio while I'm driving around or whatever. Uh, so, you know, he just, he, he was there. He just became a presence much like Jesus, as, you, as you're saying, John. Um, you know, I, I don't, I can't say for sure. I don't know for sure if he was in the real world. I'd say he, if he was certainly at least knocking at the door. <laughs> uh, I, I never asked him. He never told me. I do know one time. I mean, people would ask him in classes, uh, you know, questions like that about about him, where where he was, and he usually would turn them into jokes or or tease about it. He would never really give an answer yeah. or say something like, "It's none of your goddamn business." <laughs> <laughs> then he'd say there that tells you where you know where I must be <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do remember one time and sometime in the last couple of years somebody somebody asked him and for whatever reason in that moment he he did respond seriously and his answer was just simply uh I know that it's a dream hmm. that's really good and somebody told me that this is near his the time he was dying uh, 
but he would he'd come I, he would come back to the foundation for some reason and people were a little shocked by his look because he was getting skinny etc and he said um to them well i'm i'm not even here and and neither are you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't remember, they may, that may have been, you know, with some of the other staff, I don't remember that specifically, but I certainly can, can imagine that, that certainly was his message. <laughs> that was always his message. You know, it's, uh, don't, don't get caught in the form, nothing, nothing so blinding as perception of form. Yeah. I'd love to quote that line, and in fact, did an album, an audio right. on, on that one. Nothing so blinding as perception of form. So he was trying to get us to look with other than physical eyes. And so, so in that sense, yes. I mean, that, that was always his message. That was always his message. Bud, you got something? Yeah, we've got some more. Um, Jeff, can you speak a little more about your initial reluctance to listen to what others are saying or writing about ACIM? Uh, this individual is sharing that they sometimes feel overwhelmed by all the different voices and all the different um, uh, information that's available to us. There's a lot out there. Uh, you have to be discerning. <laughs> uh, for me, you know, this was this was just uh, I had picked up the book. I'd started reading it. I felt I just felt so strongly the presence of Jesus as I was reading the words. I was coming from a Catholic background. Uh, I knew about uh, sin, guilt, and fear. <clears throat> I was personally at that point in time was just coming out. I'd come out of a of a, a painful divorce and was now just accepting my sexuality and coming out. And I just, I remember I kept turning each page and just looking for some kind of judgment there. <laughs> I didn't realize it was my own ego <laughs> that was looking for that, that judgment. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a, there was just this sense that of this presence that I was feeling and wanting to really deepen my relationship with. Uh, <clears throat> So when this friend shared shared this tape with me, I thought, well, my teacher is Jesus. Let's hear what he has to say. I'll listen because my friend seems to think uh, that this is a value. But I, I had some skepticism. I was fortunate because he was the only one I ever really was ex exposed to. And I, when I listened to him, and as I say, initially went back to the course, I realized, oh, my God, you know, he's, he's helping. Was, the experience was like having blinders removed from my eyes. It was like I was not seeing and he was helping me really uh, hear the message that uh, was coming through in Jesus' words. And so I trusted him. I, <clears throat> I really have not listened, you know, to anybody else for, I, I, I found him and that was all I needed. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm aware, I'm aware of other, other teachers and I'm not saying, you know, that they may not also be helpful. Uh, for people, but but again, you have to be discerning. There, there are a lot of. <clears throat> excuse me a moment. There are a lot of people who still get caught in in simply making the world real, mm. and can never compromise on that, and that's why a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't like Ken Ken as a teacher. They don't they don't want to hear what he has to say, and and that's quite all right. And that never upset him. He knew not everybody would be drawn to him. I you know I think it's. I think it's probably a minority of course students that that do uh, want to hear what Ken has to say, but uh, but he's there for those who want to hear him. And uh, even his, as I, I think I said earlier, even his students have a lot of resistance to what he's saying. We we don't always want to hear it, but we trust him because we know we know that he's uh, he's telling us uh, the truth about our ego. And the truth about what lies beyond it too. You know, it's it's not only the it's not only the ego, but but you can't get to what lies beyond it. He always emphasized if you weren't willing to look at what it is that you've made made real first, it's blocking you from that experience because that's the process. It's not a process of doing anything. It's a process of, as it says itself, undoing all of the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. I know that all the way through on my reading of the course that. There was no doubt that it was true. The course itself I'm talking about now. Uh -huh. and, and and the deeper I get into it, the more I became convinced that it was. There was no doubt about it. Uh, no problem anywhere along. And Ken was certainly the number one guide <clears throat> in terms of my being able to understand how that <clears throat> whole process, because it. one of the things he used to say to me was, and I, 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 just, I 
found that he said this to other students too. Take it deeper, take it deeper. And you can you can do it. You can take taking the course deeper and deeper so you get to these progressive ahas. Yes. <laughs> They're just innumerable aha. Oh, oh that yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. It all fits together. And you, and you get, especially when you understand the metaphysics and relationship to the practical application of it, fitting those two things together is, is, is really, really wonderful. What I like personally is always because I came to the course, I was already a theology student and teaching courses and mysticism and stuff at the new school, which was interestingly enough for five blocks from where Helen and Ken lived at the time. Uh, and I still enjoy comparing the course with say Zen or non-dualism or Joel yeah. Goldsmith or with and yes. innumerable other, I mean, certainly the course is not the first book to tell us the truth. It's the, it's the first book to do it uh, in such a psychologically sophisticated and systematic way that, uh, you know, we're not just sort of guessing at philosophical speculation here. Uh, this is the truth. And John, I think you even wrote a book about A Course in Miracles and comparing to other things. Okay, well, I didn't. Uh, yes, I did. I put together a book, uh, which is <laughs> <laughs> it's an anthology, of which I only wrote two chapters. The other, other chapters are about somebody else on yoga, somebody else on Buddhism, etc. Yes. Because it's just kind of fun, yeah. anonymous, you know, to compare these different schools and look at them and, and see where they both uh, come up with the truth. I mean, I, in, a, in a way, there's nothing new in the course. It's just the, the, the process of which it's put together. There have always been mystics. I mean, there have always been people who have had these insights, who have seen the truth of God. Uh, I expect a lot of them just stay quiet, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> they didn't necessarily feel compelled to, to, to write a book about it. Right? Yeah. I, I... I too have found it helpful to read other things like that too, like from this position, uh, and just to see how it's the same message is coming through in the same way. I do think, and, and Ken has emphasized this, that the, the, the unique contribution, I think I said it earlier, that the course has made is really the purpose for the world and the whole idea that it's guilt behind the, behind the dream. You just, I don't think you find that anywhere else. And, that's uh, right yeah and that's and that's right. yeah. central central to to its practice that's what that's why it's a, a forgiveness is is, this, is really the practice of the course it's it's undoing that guilt Excellent. so here's a great topic can you guys talk about free will and can we avoid certain outcomes <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Well, the course does say there's no free will in heaven, uh, Ken has emphasized, but we are, we're free to choose to believe whatever we want, the course tells us. So in that sense, there, there's free will, uh, but, but a lot of it is, is unconscious. And, uh, but the course also says, and this is really, uh, as Ken has emphasized, a reflection of the atonement principle, we're free to believe whatever we want, but we can't make it true. <laughs> uh, truth is true. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's uh, there's there's nothing nothing that can change that. Um, so we ha we have a we do have a choice, and it is true. You know, other other, other speech, spirituality spiritualities may teach us how to change outcomes in the world. Uh, but Ken has said he he has said it's not it, things are not it's not predestination in the sense that once your life begins only one, there's one series of events that are just gonna go through a sequence. He says there's choice points all along the way. And a lot of times the choices are made unconsciously, uh, but it's it's this huge, he's used the metaphor. Originally it was a, a videotape library, then it became a DVD library. Now it would probably be an MP4 library or a streaming library. But of all of the things that could, we could possibly experience in, our, in, our, uh, in a particular lifetime. And it's not linear. And there are choices. You can go to the left, you can go to the right. Uh, but ultimately, those things don't matter, uh, is what Ken, Ken is saying. And th the fact that we still are concerned about outcomes at this level is just letting us know, okay, we still think something serious and real is going on here. And you don't want, you don't want to deny that. But you also, we also need to recognize as long as we 
are looking for particular outcomes or hoping to control an outcome here in the world, the ego is still our teacher. And there's a piece then that's, that we're just denying to ourselves because when you're choosing the ego, there has to be conflict. It's that hidden conflict that I'm in a battle between God, between myself and God. And now I've projected it out into a world and now I'm in conflict with what's happening in my life here in the world so that I don't remember where the initial uh, con conflict really, and the only real conflict that needs to be, not even resolved, that needs to be recognized that it's not real. That, one of the ways that I like, this came up in a class I was teaching just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the ways that I think it's pretty clear to recognize that there's a sort of a kind of paradox here uh, the kind of paradox is <clears throat> that God's will and your will are exactly the same will. There is no other will. So you have free will because God has free will. And, and when you get the alignment of, of your mind with that mind, then you're, you know, with the look, the look, the lesson for today is a review on lesson 87 and uh, part of it says there is no will but God's. Period. So one has to recognize that my will and God's will is the same will, then I'm, I'm okay. But then, of course, the ego is going to resist that flight and all get out because you know, that if you look, God wins, I lose. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think Ken would say, because will usually, that, that's really speaking above, that's up at the level of spirit. Yeah. The will, the will to create. So you, that re, there would be the reflection of that in the right mind. And so I think in terms right. of being aligned then with that purpose, uh, and then we experience maybe a, a, a flow within in our lives where it doesn't mean that we don't encounter obstacles, but it does, we don't lose our peace over it. And there, and there can seem to be a sense in which things do move, move more easily. But the fact that they're not moving easily isn't a, doesn't have to be an indication. You can never judge by form. Does it have to be an indication that when you see somebody having difficulties in their life, that doesn't mean that somehow their will is not aligned with, with God's or, or with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we don't know what is on somebody else's atonement path and what's most helpful for them. And we also don't know which, you know, sometimes it may seem apparent when somebody seems to be really having a, an ego fit. Uh, but uh, much of the time, it's you, may, you just may really not know. Somebody may seem peaceful and not be, or somebody may not seem peaceful, but actually is. You just can't, you can't tell. I only have to be concerned about myself. That's, that's another thing that makes the course easy. <laughs> Uh, or s simple anyway, not easy, but simple. It's only ever about what teacher I'm choosing, not what teacher anyone else is choosing. Responsibility, again, as you were saying earlier, John, that's that's what I'm really responsible for. What else you got, bud? A lot. Um, consciousness. A couple of people asked different questions about it. One was to you, Jeff, about does uh, consciousness appear somewhere on that chart? Do you feel like consciousness is on one of those three layers? And when, and then along with that is this notion of if we're training our consciousness, are we referring to choosing the miracle and forgiveness more than and identifying with the body? Yes, I, actually I, I use the chart all the time in my teaching and I've, uh, uh, many a number of times have put consciousness up by the decision maker where Ken has has son of God and decision maker consciousness I've I've put that up there as well Be, um, because that's you're saying right up right up here then right up there which means it's in the it's in the blue circle consciousness is in the blue circle in the blue circle okay yeah. it's right. okay it's it's not in the world it's not in the body you know we think that it is we think that our that our mind is in our brain in our body but that's all just part of the illusion you know it's uh it's like you know when you're when you're dreaming at night the dream figure that you think you are when you're dreaming seems to be conscious and you you know it seems like it ha has a brain that's doing things but you wake up and you realize oh no that was just all in my mind there's no there, there was the consciousness is is still there in my mind and it's it's not in the dream figure um well, i'm sorry what was the second part then so we're talking about training consciousness. Oh, training, yes, 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 yes. So yes, it's it really is just that process of yeah, r recognizing the projection, uh, and and then uh, following that arrow that's on the right side that's labeled the miracle. Following that back up to uh, it's really it's a sh 
you could think of that arrow as an, on the board, actually, the, the physical board, Ken had, a, had a, a magnetic blue ball that he used to move around. And it, the magnetic blue ball, you could think of it either as our identification or where our attention is. And, and our attention and our identification can go down into the world, but we're, we're still a mind. We're still a mind that's uh, dreaming of a world. And so what we need to do then is to shift our attention and our identification back to the mind and away from, away from the body. And that's what the miracle does. We, we shift out of that, uh, the, the ego trap of believing that, well, we, we're, you know, we're not ready to get out of the belief that this is who we are, but that we have no other choice in terms of how we're experiencing what we're experiencing. And that's what the miracle helps us recognize that it's coming from this choice as a mind and not from anything related to the situation that I seem to be experiencing. So that's- Yeah, and, and that's so just, just to be clear then, we are this consciousness. Yes. The question is, what are we aware of? What are we focused on? Yes. Are, are we aligning our thinking, our awareness, our focus with thoughts that represent egoic processes? Or are we thinking, are we aligning, our, is our awareness focused on thoughts that align with God, with love, with all of those harmonics? Yes, and it's we don't really know we still don't really know what lo love is. So Ken has often said that uh, we can't really choose love, but we can choose against the, the guilt and the hatred of the ego. And, and when we let go of that, what remains then is, is, the, is the love. So in, in that sense, uh, you know, the, the training, uh, the mind is being trained simply to recognize its projections and to realize that it has a choice about them. And when we recognize that we are choosing guilt and then we decide we don't want that any longer, that's when we can join with, we join with the right mind that then just is, is looking on all of that and saying, it's, it's not serious. And then our experience in the world can shift and we're no longer in the conflict that we were caught in before. Uh, but it, yeah, it, that, it's a practice that we just keep doing over and over and over again from moment to moment. Uh, again, Ken has said, we just, we go back and forth between the ego and the Holy Spirit. And we need to recognize as soon as we can, when we've gone to the ego again. And, and that's really the training. The training really is recognizing the ego and all of its subtleties. The, you know, the, the, the special hate is easier to recognize, but the, the special love is, uh, is subtler, subtler. And it's, and it's very seductive. And it's what keeps us coming back to the world, mm -hmm. thinking that it, that it does offer us something something that we can, a certain kind of pleasure that can't be experienced simply as a mind. Why don't you have, bud? So, so John, you mentioned this earlier and, and so did you, Jeff. Can you both speak to your personal relationship with Jesus and how he's helped you heal your mind? Okay. Um, you know, I started off as a, as a minister uh, when I was really, really young. I mean, I had a church at the age of 18 that I was serving as a, while I was in college. And, you know, at one point you had to make a, a commitment to, uh, had you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? And my answer to that was yes. I had no question about that. My mother very nicely, let me just actually show you this. This is so strange. Um, so my mother very nicely gave me this picture when I was about 13 years old and it was over my bed. So I had a relationship with this guy. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just a, a picture, but it's still, there was this meaningful kind of, of connection that was there and that that has always been there. There's never been any kind of doubt about that. So when I discovered that Jesus is the author of this book, why uh, that's even more exciting and, so of course I want to get into it and study it as, as deeply as I can. That's my simplest, uh, simplest kind of answer to that. That's always been me. I've, yeah, I'm, I'm aware from when I was a young child, I always had a, a just kind of a, a, a draw, I felt drawn to Jesus. I know when the, the Catholic church, uh, Catholic school that I went to uh, for grade school had a huge uh, cross with a life-size statue of, of the oh, crucified Jesus on it. 
And, but for whatever reason, for me, it wasn't a fearful symbol. And mm -hmm. I used to go up uh, when the church was empty and just kneel there and, and talk to Jesus <laughs> and talk about what was going on. And I, I did I, things like uh, Good Friday were always very meaningful to me and his, his, his crucifixion and all. But somewhere along the line, though, I think it was, I think it was in my late teens, it was when I was at the university, uh, that, uh, and I was, I was aware of my sexuality, even though I wasn't going to be acting on it, I was aware of it, and, and I was aware of these judgments that were coming from the church, and I, I just had this feeling, somewhere along the line, the church lost Jesus' message, uh, right. and, and so at least the, the Roman Catholic Church had, and I, also, just aware, I just had this thought, I think that, that Jesus is a, is a great teacher, but I don't think that he's God. So I don't know where that had come from, but I, it was just something that was also there with this, this shift that, start, that happened then in, my, in my late teens when I was in college. And then I just kind of set him aside uh, and became much more of an agnostic with no religion. And it really wasn't until uh, after, after my divorce and I started opening up uh, I was in my mid thirties and spiritual questions started to really arise for, for me at that point and start, started exploring things, met people who were psychics, who were channeling things and read different channel materials. And then somebody who was actually, she was a fundamentalist Christian, but she told me about A Course in Miracles. She was the first one really to, to tell me about it. And she said, you know, if you're going to read any of that kind of stuff, I would go to the source. <laughs> and it, it hadn't worked for her, but she said, I might find it of value. And and uh, so I did finally get a hold of a copy of it, as I said, in uh, December of 1986, and was just so drawn to it. And it was like I was recognizing this was that, that presence that I had been just sort of put on the back burner for, for a good uh, probably 15, 18 years, something like that. And, and now it was like he was, he, he was there all along, but I was back again. <laughs> now just really open to wherever it was, was he was going to leave me. And, and I think that... Uh, my relationship with him is, has certainly deepened over, over time. I, I, I think I've, I've, for me personally, I've trusted him all along. Uh, and so that's, that's been helpful for me. I, I know a lot of people, and a lot of people who are, who've been raised Catholic have some real issues with, with Jesus because of the Jesus of, uh, of Roman Catholicism, the, the judgmental Jesus, but for whatever reason that just, it, for, for me personally, it hadn't really stuck somehow. I, I, as I say, I had that sense that they'd gotten his message all wrong. So he he just he continues to be uh, just for me for me on my own path, my most important presence, the teacher that I that I just always turn to. Excellent. So here's another question, and then we can uh, we can shift this as you wish, John. Okay. Um, just insight on what's going on behind the curtains of the foundation, so to speak. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're very busy. There's, there's, there's lots, there's always lots going on. Uh, I don't know if people may be aware that uh, we had a brief period where we, we only had like one, one new audio release a year when we were in our transition with our move, but now we've got um, Emmy on our staff. We joined the staff a year after me. She, she's the new one on the staff. She's, been here only what is it like 27 years <laughs> uh, oh i shouldn't say that and then all the henderson folk of course are newer but in terms of the the old time from, from from oscar uh but but she she's been trained on on editing uh ken's audio tapes along with the help of virginia who's uh we do have some tr transcripts that then really help guide everything in terms of the editing process so that that's continuing behind the scenes all Elizabeth's just very much involved with lots of things around uh, things for the internet, uh, things for our emails, all of the content emails that are going out. Uh, Dave and James are working on, uh, Dave, as I say, has he's handling so much of the stuff, nearly all of the stuff related to administrative responsibilities. James, uh, James is packing our Amazon orders and uh, is doing all of our tech stuff. We're in the middle right now of redesigning our website. So there, there's just always lots, lots going on, keeping all of us busy. Gloria had made the decision not, not to make the, the move to Henderson from Temecula. So she's, she's still back in, in Temecula. So she's still, her, her involvement is, is primarily through, through her son, Dave. Now they're, they're in touch. Uh, but the, you know, the rest of us were, we're just 
I, I think we, we really share this commitment uh, of just wanting to make sure that we can do everything we can to, to assure that Ken's message continues to be available. And uh, as I say, we've got new pro. We've, we've got a new one actually even coming this week on the first. There's a there'll be a new release on April first. It's called Strengthening the Mind's Immune System. <laughs> Everybody's concerned about the immune system these days, so uh, we, it seems like an appropriate one for for what's what's going on in the world right now. Uh, but but those will continue uh, for however long because because we have quite a few. Just about everything of Kenneth's was recorded when we were in uh, Temecula. So there's quite a quite a backlog of things there. And we have some notes too, in terms of things that he would have wanted to, to have published sooner. So, and I, I'm involved in, uh, I'm, I early on, I got involved in, in uh, customer service and pro, uh, taking orders for a while. I was actually involved in processing orders and shipping. I don't do that any longer, but I still, still take orders over the phone and I'm involved in customer service and I'm involved in teaching uh, and I've, uh, still working some, I had some accounting related responsibilities uh, that Laurel, Laurel on our staff who, who, uh, who died a few years ago, uh, turned over to me so that she could do a lot of the editing uh, of materials for Ken for publication. So uh, with her death and Carla, who had been on our staff until the move here, took over some of those things. And now it's Emmy that's involved in that. So we, you know, things rotate. Sometimes they slow down again when people are learning new things. But uh, uh, Dave has taken over a lot of, of the uh, accounting kinds of pieces that I had picked up from Laurel. Uh, and so, but I still kind of supervise a lot of that with the people that are doing those things, Julie and, and, and Dave. So we, we, all, we all have plenty to do. <laughs> Seems like never a dull moment. So, Bud, now if you, if you want to shift to see if anybody wants to actually come on to screen and ask a question themselves rather than having it uh, translated to the chat uh, we'll we'll open the floor to that and we will go over obviously we we're 15 20 minutes late getting started because of that technical problem and uh, so if there's anybody who would like to raise their hand and actually come on and, and speak uh, you may do so go ahead oh i don't know hello um can anyone tell me anything about rosemary Oh, sure. Yes. Rosemary decided not to make the move when we made the move. That was in, in uh, September of 2018, the four of us who are here from, who all, you know, all go back to, to Roscoe days. She decided to, to remain there. So she's, she's not officially on the staff, but we're still in, in regular contact with her and we get her input on things. She's, we, we really value her judgment on, on different pub publication related prog projects that we're working on. Um, so yes, yeah, so she's she's still you know not involved at the level that obviously that she was when she was in California, but she's she's still she's still a presence for us for sure. Thank you so much, Jeff. Sure, we'll go to uh, Alice next, but just to let you know, if if you want to ask a question, just literally raise your hand like Alice has done there, and uh, you can kind of get online uh, to do that. So, Alice, Fred. <laughs> um. What's going on that involves people outside in any of the academies or classes, or do you do live stream classes right now, um, working with Ken's materials and who is doing the classes? You, Jeff, or is anybody else? I, you know, I've never met Rosario Sasso, although I talked to her on the phone, as to those that were doing classes with Ken that are still continuing that. Yes, yes. Uh, back in, after Ken's death, uh, Rosemary and Laurel and I were all involved in teaching for a while and then and then Laurel did become sick uh, and, uh, and so then it was just Rosemary, Rosemary and I for the last uh, year or so. Uh, since the move here now to uh, Henderson, uh, I began doing some teaching back in uh, January of 2019, so just a little over two years ago. And uh, I've been I've been doing a weekly pod well, it was a weekly class and it began as just a weekly class with people locally primarily attending. If people were in from out of town, they, they uh, could come as well. Um, and, and then we were recording that and we've been making it available as a free, free uh, podcast on our streaming website. So we've been doing that. We've got like 107 or 108 uh, classes that, that have gone as we, we're only up to, to chapter five. 
<laughs> on Ken's journey through the text. So you know, we're not we're not trying to push through the material quickly. We're we're exploring it. You got a lot of living to do, Jeff. <laughs> I know. I figured it was going to be something like twenty years before. We can, really? You know, maybe only fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then also been offering every other month. We've been doing a a, a one day seminar, and that and that I had st started doing that as well with the pandemic. And we had people coming in from all over. It's a small room. We can accommodate about twenty people in in that room. And uh, as I say, it's small, much smaller than what we had back in, in Temecula. And we, um, with the pandemic, we actually had a two-day program scheduled the week that uh, things really began to be locked down. And we just made a, a, a decision about five days before the program that we were just going to have to make it available. We were offering streaming. We were doing that back in Temecula too. We were offering streaming. We would make that available to people, but we just felt it was not safe to allow people to come and congregate in a, in a small room like that. So we ended up uh, canceling the, the live attendance and we um, did it. We did the two day program, uh, just, just simply the streaming program with no audience. It was at that time, Virginia always uh, sat in on, she was always there and she sometimes would, would uh, raise questions or make, make comments. And so I asked her if she would be willing to be in the room with me uh, for the program. Uh, and we would keep our social distance, but we would be wearing masks. And she she agreed to do that. And she, over time, she's had stepped more and more into a into that role of of being there to uh, participate as more than just simply a a student, but taking on more of a teaching function. So we do now, uh, just as of of this year now, we are we are indicating that Virginia is also in the role of teacher. We're doing these programs together. So there's there are the two of us that are involved in 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 teaching now, both for the weekly classes, which have continued to happen. The next the next one day program won't be until May. We had one just about, about two weeks ago. And Rosemary and I still talk from time to time about maybe we will be able to do a class together again. We're, we're, we were hoping that maybe we could do that yet this year at some point. So it, it hasn't yet materialized. And of course, we're waiting to see what happens around the the whole situation with with the uh, the pandemic and vaccines and all of that, but uh, but yeah, we, we've continued on with uh, as I was saying earlier, the the chart Ken's chart is always it's always there behind me in the focus of the teaching that that I'm doing. It it just always assures that the Ken's perspective it has to be re represented. It's, it's the only one that, that for me makes any sense. So hopefully that that answers. Well, I haven't thought of doing anything like what John's doing with sort of these group Zoom sessions and discussions. Actually, uh, the camera that I'm on right now <laughs> is one. I was actually going to do this from home, and it turned out what I had at home wasn't good enough with, with my laptop. And so we actually have purchased some things to begin to explore doing either Zoom or you know some some kind of a, a live streaming format. So there'll be interaction like this. So we're we're yeah we're a little behind the times. Uh, but yes, we're definitely, we're, we may be testing some things uh, very shortly. We've got, we've got what we need now to go ahead and begin to check it out. So that, so that may be happening. And now that I have my first one of these under my belt, <laughs> uh, I won't wonder quite so much what it's, what the experience is like. This is, this is, for me, has been very helpful. And, and how do you sense Ken's presence? I hear him auditorily when I'm studying the course and he usually says the word dear. And then I hear a slight, occasionally a slight stutter. And uh -huh. so I kind of help, I feel like he's there interactively when I'm going through the workbook lessons and Fred and I read them together and study them in the morning. And we go, we take a paragraph each and then we share Ken's writings and then inner commentary of what we're, we're getting out of the, the journey through books. Uh, for myself, uh, it's, it's not that specific. Uh, it's, it's more of a sense. I just, I have a feeling at times, uh, and a lot of times it's just in the way things seem to be happening. And I, uh, from immediately after, I think the very first program, uh, Ken had actually asked us, uh, when he was at, at, in December, even before, you know, uh, before his death, he still had had thoughts that he might be able to do the March program, and he had asked, but and that was going to be a five day program, which he already did on, would always do just on his own. But he had approached the three of us 
uh, who had been involved in, in his three-day academies, Rosemary, Laurel, and me, and, and had asked us if we would be willing to help him teach. So when he was no longer here, physically in March, uh, the decision was made and Gloria said, you know, we'll still offer the program. And it was like, okay, you know, we're going to help you, Ken. We'll do it. And I, you know, I just kind of had that sense. And I said in that program, and I, I mean, it, it hasn't waned at all that Ken still, he spoke of the course of, of the staff as like an orchestra. And we had to each, we played different instruments, but the point was that we needed to just be willing to do our part to accept the conduct, the leading from the conductor and allow our music to, to blend. Uh, and, and that was how the music would be made. And, that, and so the staff, it, there was not supposed to be any you know, soloist or virtuosos. Everybody was just simply to do their part. And we may all be playing different instruments, but the music needed every instrument. And I just have had the sense and just the way everything has continued to unfold that Ken still holds the baton. He holds the baton and he's still, he's still conducting all of it. Uh, and it just, it happens in funny, just different little ways that a sense of, I didn't know that, you know, I, I had no idea that that was what that was for. How did this happen? And the whole move itself, we didn't know how it was gonna happen. And it was just incredible how, how smoothly it went. It was, it was terrifying to us before it was happening. Uh, terrifying, maybe too strong for some of us, but not for, for all of us. Uh, it was uh, a, a big shift, but it was astounding just how the whole foundation, the move, the physical move the, of the foundation itself for the four of us personally, and for setting up the, the, the building here just went so beautifully. And so there was just the sense that we weren't doing this on our own. We clearly were not doing this on our own. So that, Leslie, that's how I experienced it. I think I, Leslie would like to. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Alice. I, I'm new to the course and I'm reading Ken's blue books for the workbook, I'm loving it. Yes. I'm, I'm experiencing um, a profound sense of sadness and grief at the idea of separation. I made to separate from God and speaks a lot about the guilt and anger and I'm I think about Kubler-Ross's grief process and the multiple levels in that and try and make sense of myself through that but um is there anything he says about a, a profound sense of sadness with it because I can't seem to get in touch with this I mean of course I have anger and of course I do the attack thoughts I see that but the majority of what I feel is this horrible sadness and anxiety at having left God and and thinking I had, which is the illusion. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Ken has said that that the ego, I mean, guilt or fear are like the fundamental emotions, but they take lots of different forms. And so sadness is one of them. Uh, the profound sadness is serving the ego function still of saying it has happened. It has happened. I really have lost the love. I've lost my innocence. And it's what you want to be able to recognize is that you, any feelings that we were having, we never want to deny them because they really are, they are helping us get in touch with what it is that we do still believe. So, so it, it sounds like you've already identified what it's about. You're recognizing what it's, what it's about. And you just, when I mean, you stay with that, you, br you bring those feelings and the thoughts that you know are there behind them to your inner teacher and just say, you know, this, this is still the sense that I'm having. I, I still believe that I'm apart from the love, that, I, that I've, there is that sense. Ken, Ken talks about it on, uh, well, it, he addresses it some in uh, one of the, the Shakespeare sets uh, on Othello and, and then uh, also on the Othello syndrome, but this, this sense of incredible loss that we feel and that we're responsible for it and that we can't undo it, that we can't, that we can't do anything to change it. And that, again, it, it's helpful to be in touch with it. You just want to be able to acknowledge that it isn't what it ultimately it isn't what it seems to be, and that's 
that's not certainly not where we're going to end up. That there, the more we're able to, at least in moments, join with with Jesus or you know whoever you identify as your inner teacher, uh, in those moments where you're experiencing experiencing any sense of love, it's really. Uh, it's saying that sadness is not justified. It, you know, and that doesn't mean that we'll, we won't go back to it. It's, that's part of the process of the going back, back and forth. Um, but it may begin to lose some of its power over time as, because like everything else, it's a choice. And so we're, we may not be in touch with it, but it has to be that we are choosing to have that feeling. Uh, it's it's not truly based on anything real, but it's based on something that we believe is real. And, and again, it, you know, can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we're not trying to heal the separation <laughs> because it never really happened. We're trying to heal our belief in the separation, and that's that's hope. That's hopeful. That's possible. <laughs> you can't heal the separation <laughs> because it didn't happen. And if it did, there'd be no no way to get, to get back. Right. That's what the ego wants us to believe. Any others who would like to uh, actually come on and ask the question uh, actively on screen? Y'all would like to, if that's possible. Yeah. Thanks, John. And it's good to see you, Jeff. Uh, John, hi. Hi. Um, I'm not seeing you yet, but I'm hearing your voice. <laughs> there, you. okay. there we are. Um, being uh, going to the foundation for many years, and, and and especially doing this today, which has been wonderful, is whenever I think of Ken, whenever I used to see him, I would have this internal um, I would start to weep with the, with with the love that I cannot even come close to with any other person I've ever been in the presence of. And that's what I miss about Ken so much. And, uh, and I'm glad we're doing this thing about Ken. And uh, it was beyond my conscious mind of what was going on. But whenever I was in his presence and whenever I ever interacted with him, and even now I feel his presence. Yeah. I just want to weep. And I want to fall apart because I've never experienced the love that uh, that emanated from someone, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm just so glad that we're here together today, remembering Ken and what he brought to us. And, and believe me, boy, I've I've never experienced a, a love um, that was right in front of me and quite palpable. It's touched my heart and my heart sings every time uh, I have uh, that we ever come to talk about or even think about Kevin. So yeah. thanks guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking too, as you're, as you're saying that I know Ken would, Ken would want us to recognize we, you can't deny the fact that you experience him as the love is emanating from him. And of course, what, what he would want us all to recognize is that that he and I know you know this, John. Of course, that the the he was not the source of the love, but he certainly was the symbol through which so many of us experienced it. And so you know we're grateful that he was willing to to be that instrument. But he would not want us, you know, to stay caught on the symbol. I know you've heard him say many times, "Don't don't confuse symbol with source." And so that's you know I, that's what he's saying now too. You know, it's like use the symbol because it's helpful but don't stop there don't stop there you you want to be able to recognize that that experience does not depend on any form uh and whether it, you know it may be the specific form of being in someone's physical presence or even the memory of them uh, but if we still link it to the form that then Ken was always cautioning us is, is making it special because we're making it specific. And his lesson to us was always that you don't want to get caught in, caught in that. You want to recognize it when it happens. You don't want to deny it. We're going to continue to do it. 
but we want to recognize it and remember that the goal is always to move beyond it. And so, so Ken, I know the last thing he would want us to do would be to make him special. And, and everybody had so many special experiences with Ken that it's, you know, it's, it's hard not to, but we've got to remember his, his teaching. And he, he just keeps calling to us to come to the place where he knows we are and, and where, you know, he's always been. And, and it, there, there, the experience can always, always be ours. Prior to meeting uh, Helen and Bill and Ken, uh, I had just a little prior to that, I'd been in India and I'd studied with three different gurus and I really came back kind of disenchanted with uh, the guru worship stuff. And I was a little concerned about that around Ken, Bill and Helen, but boy, it didn't take long to realize that neither one of the three of them was going to do any put up with any kind of, and you try to put them on a pedestal, they'll just knock it right out from under you. <laughs> so that was not going to happen. That was really endearing feature. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Ken, over the years, I mean, he just, any attempts at that, he just always, he had a way of deflecting it. It was so clear that was not the role that he wanted to assume. I mean, if he didn't mind being a symbol to get in touch with the love, but you just, he was always directing you to that love within. Don't get caught. Don't get caught in the form. You know, I was once at, uh, I was at Roscoe and when Ken was his 50th birthday and um, people were wanting to sing happy birthday to him, <laughs> but they were kind of mulling around and when nobody noticed, he slipped out the door. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him, he went out his back door and it's like, <laughs> oh, the heck was singing happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He had never wanted it to be about him. I mean, his favorite, I, I think, certainly, certainly was the, the poem that he read the most in, across all the programs over the years was a Jesus prayer. And uh, it just, that was it, the the closing stanza on that was something, I mean, it even quotes it in an absence from Felicity. And to speak about his birthday, it was a, it was a, the poem that uh, he really lobbied heaven to write, Helen to write for him for, mm -hmm. His, his, I think it was his 34th birthday and she, and she, and he wanted a poem on Jesus and she, she wrote him a Jesus prayer. And, but in, in absence from Felicity, he reads or he quotes the last four lines of it. I, let me, I've got it here. I just want to read it because it does so typify how, how he wanted us to, to view him really. Uh, and so the last four lines are a perfect and this is, remember, it's a Jesus prayer, so it's to Jesus. A perfect prayer of what I can be. You show to me that I might help renew your brother's failing sight. As they look up, let them not look on me, but only you. And so that was, that was how Ken just, he, he really lived his life. He really did wanting us to remember the source and not the, not the symbol. Joanne, uh, would you like to ask a question or make an observation? Yes. Hi. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Oh, Joy. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess my question is that I seem to have lost a lot of progress with the course in the last number of years progress meaning i just feel so much more serious and i'm so attracted to every little guilt thing um i feel like i'm running 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 kind of in fear and i, I know that's kind of common um i just didn't know if you had any other thoughts about it or it's very i find it very hard to not judge myself and not you know yeah. be gentle with it yes but i'm upset that i'm i don't know i i feel upset that i can't get back on track <laughs> the our judgment is is really only the ever oh, the only problem that we ever have in these kinds of situations um I, as we go deeper it can seem at times like it's getting harder. Uh, we're exposing more of the underbelly of the ego, if you will. 
And the most helpful thing is just to be willing to stay with it and not judge it as a, as a measure of your progress, because it's not, it, it really isn't. Ken has said over and over again, you know, quoting those lines from the course that we, do, we can't judge, you know, what we think is our uh, greatest advances can be our biggest retreats and what we think of as our retreats are really some of our greatest progress. So the fact that it's there before you doesn't mean in any way at all that you're not, that you've fallen off. You know, if, if, if the willingness is still there, just simply to look at what's there, that's, that's what's going to be helpful. And it, and it can seem the, it's like a dark night of the soul. It can seem to take, take a long time because uh, it's well, it's like as Ken talks about the fifth stage in the development of, of trust. Uh, and Jesus says that this can take a long, long time because we're we're trying to recognize the valuelessness of of the self that we believe that we are, and not just the the self, the figure, the figure of the dream, but the the, the separate self in, in the mind that we still are trying to cling to, the, the ego self. So there's it's it's not an easy path, but because it is yeah. so so direct. Uh, and that's where trust comes in. You just you, you stay stay with what's there as much as you can. Keep Ken or Jesus, whoever you know, whoever you, you find helpful, close by. To share what's going on with them, but uh, just just to recognize that the ego is trying to join this by judging it and saying that I, I I should be farther along. This shouldn't be happening. I I shouldn't be having these reactions. Who says? <laughs> That's only the ego. That's yeah. only the well, Ken, Ken said there was a lot of like, it was a whole issue around fear and attraction to guilt. Yeah. Um, so you can't really write him letters anymore, but. <laughs> sure you can. Sure you can I like what you said about the connection though, because I do feel that my, my ego would want to just dismiss it. You know? But... Yeah. yeah, I think you should still write him letters. <laughs> There's so just, many already, man. <laughs> I mean, you, you only have to do them in your mind, or you can just talk to them. But you know, yeah. you may be surprised. You may be surprised at what, what, where, what answers you might, you might still get. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Nice, nice to uh, be part of this. Is there anybody else who'd like to come on and question uh, John and Jeff? Um, yeah, I just, um, I haven't heard, I came on a little late, but I, um, the thing I haven't heard anybody mention yet is, um, his sense of humor, Ken's sense of humor. And it's like, and Jesus I've is. never seen anywhere else. Like he, I think he was the best, the biggest practical joker I have ever seen, you know? And, uh, so many times I would be there in Roscoe and he pulled something on somebody and I think, We'll never see that person again, and it will be exactly what that person needed, you know, for to go through for the lesson. And he would know that. I would not know it, but he would, you know. And uh, so that, that I found that amazing and real eye opener too. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah, I, I'm glad you raised it because that was something I, I meant to mention earlier when I'm talking about his his gentleness, his kindness, and passion. Humor, humor, absolutely, uh, was was central to it and you know i i don't think you know we we think of ken as as maybe knowing what he was doing <laughs> i think he just <laughs> always trusted what he was doing yeah. he really wasn't the source of it so if he had that sense that this would be helpful it wasn't because he knew how that, that person was going to receive it but he just trusted yeah. that he was a channel and and that his ego was 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 not if, if there was any there was not in the way and so that's why he could just be so free to express whatever and do things that you could seem outrageous because because people people recognize the content you know the ego says it's the form i i guess I, there are people like he dumped in the he picked and dumped into the dumpster back in roscoe or yes smeared, smeared stuff on their glasses and you know yes. and they all just felt loved <clears throat> because that was the content even though the form was a form of attack and that was what's so was so powerful yeah. Uh, he was showing that it's not in the form. The form may look like an attack. Yeah, we had we had a, a a woman in our in our group here, um, and her husband never came to the group. But when we were we decided to go to uh, Temecula, Temecula, and 
so he wanted to go too and i thought <laughs> uh i don't I'm, I'm sitting here wondering i don't think this this is going to go too well for a whole week you know because he he didn't care He's much here. for the course yeah. and so the first first morning check-in you know uh everybody had a, a okay. some kind of container with their name tags in it and our friend is is going through and he's going through all the name tags and Ken comes up and he just slaps his hand. He says, stop that, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? And mm -hmm. it turns out, you know, they were like buddies the whole week and didn't have anything to do with, with the course, you know, as far as mm -hmm. speaking the course, but that was a perfect thing to do, you know, to, yeah. to um, ease, you know, ease whatever tensions he might've had. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, but, but, you know, again, not in terms of not making Ken special, it's, it's like, we, we all have that, that potential within us to be like, with us, like that with others. And, you know, we may, maybe we're not going to be on all the time like Ken, Ken was, but, you know, that there is that possibility. I mean, and that's so important that, again, as we we're talking about uh, not seeing Ken as special, it's like that, that love that was coming through him mm -hmm. will come through any of us and all of us when we just get our ego out of the way. Yeah. So that's, that's a good point, Jeff. I think it has something to do with being awake and alive. You know, he's like awake and alive <laughs> yeah. all, all the time. But yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, th th there's no conflict, there's no tension, there's no energy that's being directed inward. So it can just all flow through you. Right, right. Lenny? Yeah. I just wanted to comment on Jesus' sense of humor in the course. Like he lays out all these stupid things that we really believe. So look at this stuff, will you? You know, it's, it's really amazing. He just yeah. it out there like, what? Yeah, you can hear him laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah well, my favorite has always been you. You still think that your understanding is a powerful contribution to the truth and makes it what it is. No, he's mm. got that tongue stuck in his cheek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to sort of throwing something back at someone like if somebody was sort of an attack or something like that uh he would just disarm that right away and turn it around yes. turn it yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 can i ask you a question hey jeff yes john here good to see uh, you yeah john, there is, yes hi, hi john and and thank you and john for this presentation today, really unbelievable. I have one question I'm just dying. I've been at, wanting to ask for a while. In in the last year of Ken's life, he put out that newsletter. I think it might've been the treachery of images, supposed to be in three. Right, the three part one. Part three never came about. I think it was due in March because in the interim, Ken had passed in December. Was there ever any notes or drafts or anything for part three of that newsletter? That's a um, you know, I'm I'm not sure where he was with that exactly. Um, well, that's his unfinished work then, I guess. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, that for us to finish. There's a few unfinished works there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. Graver is dealing with his uh, big work on. Freud and right. young, right. a million words he's trying to work through. Yeah. 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 I just had to ask that. Thank you. Yes. Yes, John. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Thank you, John. You know, well, I've got a comment I, I wanted to make based on a lot of things that we've heard today, if I could add my one and a half cents worth. For me, the opening to the course. I, I don't know how many times I've reread the introduction over and over and over again. And the whole notion of removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence and this idea of, of a relationship. And, and for me, the power has been for the course in the 30 years I've been studying it is about improving my relationship with God. And we get to practice that relationship with everybody around us. And by improving my relationship with everyone around me, I'm improving my relationship with the divine. Right. Yes. So we'll wrap up. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. I, Jeff, would you like to say anything in closing? I have the one to share the Lord's Prayer from Courts and Miracles as a benediction. 
I, I just want to say thank you, John, for this opportunity. It's been it's been really a, a, a wonderful one, and uh, just always uh, the opportunity to, to share about Ken and you know and how much he's he has shared with all of us is yeah. a blessing. Well, I really wanted to do this, and I'm I'm really glad that we got to it, and I'm hopeful that we'll. Do something like this again down the road. And thank you too for everyone who joined us today and who was who was able to today. And uh, right, I really appreciate that as well. well I'll just read this uh, out loud, and maybe you can read it with me with your mic off or uh, close your eyes, whatever you'd like to do. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the mind which you created and which you love. Amen. So we'll go back into gallery view and uh, kind of wave goodbye to whoever would <laughs> like to wave goodbye. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I am Very nice. Free, for I am still as God created me. I am not a body. I am free. For I am still, as God created me.